Hi there, this is Dr. Golding, and we're going to uh, continue our discussion of John Stuart Mill today. I thought I'd do something a little different today since it's such a beautiful day um, outside at the Bellarmine campus in the quad, and you can probably recognize that is Robert Bellarmine behind me here. And um, obviously I don't have a board outside, a chalkboard, so I did send you uh, some notes that you could sort of use while you're uh, taking notes on the lecture. As I mentioned in the email that I sent you, um, those notes are uh, not really fully self-explanatory, So, um, but that's kind of like in place of my writing on the board today. And today we're going to wrap up our discussion of Mill and talk about a few different things basically five different things. Number one is, let's talk a little bit about um, the notion of a maximal versus a minimal moral theory. We did mention this before in connection with Hobbes. I'm not sure if I touched upon it yet with Mill, but we're gonna hit it again. And if we did talk about it with Mill, we're just gonna go over this point again. Um, some theories of morality or ethics are maximal they are very demanding. In other words, if, 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 if a maximal theory of morality is true, that would mean that we really have a lot of obligations, that to be moral involves quite a lot. A minimal moral theory is a theory which is not very demanding upon us. A minimal moral theory would be, I think of all the theories that we've talked about in this class, Thomas Hobbes's theory is the most minimalistic uh, what that means is that it expects you to do very little. In order to be moral, according to Hobbes, you basically have to not violate the social contract. You also have to keep the law, but that might sort of depend, you know, how demanding that might be uh, would, would vary from place to place. Um, and usually keeping the law is, you know, minimal. I mean, you have to pay taxes, but, you know, no stealing, no, 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 uh, no murder but it doesn't really demand that you do a lot. Uh, so Hobbes's theory is an example of a minimalistic or relatively speaking more minimal theory. Now Mill's theory is really a maximal theory because remember that according to Mill, the fundamental principle is that one should always act in such a way as to uh, maximize happiness in society at large. So that means that every one of us has an obligation. What's morally right is to try to do that action which will bring about the greatest amount of happiness in society at large. Uh, so for example, if I am, let's say I'm reasonably well off, maybe I'm not rich, but I'm, let's suppose I have some excess cash um, and I can you know, help people out with that money, I can give charity, um, whether it's here or maybe in some other part of the world perhaps, but uh, wherever that charity is going to go to, if I can help people and make them happier, if I, can, if I can help people and make them happier, it turns out that I have, uh, that that's the morally right thing to do. I mean, if I have money that I can spend on, you know, going to a ball game versus money I can spend on giving it to charity, then um, I'm gonna get some happiness out of going to the ball game, but on balance, if I give that money to poor people who really need it, they're gonna be a lot happier than, um, than I am going to be happy going to a ball game. So um, that's the kind of thing. Mill's principle is a demanding moral theory. It is a maximal moral theory. Um, and we're gonna see later on today whether maybe that's a problem. Maybe it's just too demanding. Um, but for now, let's just leave it at that. Uh, I mean, let me just give you one more example, actually. Um, suppose you're walking down the street and um, you pass by someone and uh, you smile at them and say hello. So you kind of cheer them up a little bit. Well, according to Mill, you did something morally praiseworthy. You did by smiling, you increase happiness in society a little bit. The total net gain um, of happiness was greater because you smile than if you just walked on by without smiling. 
So, um, whereas according to Hobbes, smiling at someone in the street is, it, you know, that's not part of the social contract. You didn't contract, uh, contractually agree to smile at people in the street to make them happy. So, according to Hobbes, that would not be a moral action, whereas according to Mill, it would be a morally praiseworthy action and something that if you have the ability to do, you should do it. Okay, that's point number one. Now, the second thing that I'd like to talk about is um, how Mill might apply his principle, or how we might apply the principle of utilitarianism uh, to a couple of, let's call them uh, problematic or controversial questions. Uh, for example, a lot of people today debate the morality of the death penalty, okay? We do have the death penalty in certain states, in certain countries for certain crimes, um, and some people think the death penalty is wrong or inhumane. So let's just talk a little bit of how Mill might apply or how any utilitarian might apply the principle of utility to the uh, question of whether the death penalty is morally right or wrong. So remember that, let me go over that point again, we talked about consequentialism, right? That Mill's theory is consequentialistic. It's a consequentialist theory, uh, which means that the moral worth or rightness or wrongness of an action is going to be judged by its consequences. We have to look according to Mill, at the net gain or net loss in terms of social happiness when evaluating whether a given action is um, right or wrong. So um, if someone commits a certain kind of crime, uh, let's suppose it's um, premeditated murder, okay? Someone commits premeditated murder. And let's suppose we've caught the person and he's in jail, and he's been convicted and found guilty of committing premeditated murder. And now we have to decide, okay, well, what should we do with this person? What should we do with people who uh, commit premeditated murder? So um, the morality of the death penalty is gonna be determined by the net gain or net loss that it would bring about for society overall. So, for example, if it could be proven, or if there was some evidence, let's suppose, to believe that putting people to death for having committed murder will save lives more than it won't. Let's suppose we could somehow prove that the death penalty is effective in, um, in saving people's lives in the long run, maybe because it's a deterrent, um, that means to say that if people know they might get the death penalty for murder, then maybe they'll be less likely to commit murder. Um, plus, uh, we're getting rid of this person. The person who committed the murder himself is, is being uh, put to death, so therefore he's not going to be committing murder again, although you could say, well, if we put him in prison for life and we lock him up, he's probably not going to be able to commit a murder again too. Um, but if, the point is, if there could be evidence that uh, shows that the death penalty will save innocent lives, or save any lives for that matter, then it's going to be the morally right thing to do. Or if there's some other beneficial consequence for putting this person to death, um, then, then which, which would outweigh the costs, okay? There are costs involved in putting to some, someone to death. Um, given the way our system works, there's going to be a lot of legal expenses and um, uh, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and energy to determine whether the person really uh, is guilty or going through all the appeals and such. So there's going to be a certain social cost to implementing the death penalty. It's also going to be perhaps painful for the fellow or the person who has committed the uh, murder. We have to take into account the pain and suffering that the death penalty causes to um, 
the um, the murderer and and his family is going to be uh, perhaps uh, not too happy with that. It's going to decrease their happiness. But the idea is that we're going to engage in some kind of calculation here, which is going to and this is sometimes called the uh, utilitarian calculus, um, which is going to determine whether it's right or wrong to put the person to death or not. Um, well, one of the things we probably wouldn't be looking at if we adopt utilitarianism is it's not about revenge, it's not about um, the past, it's not about cleansing society of some past uh, ill. Um, it's a, it has to be a forward-looking reason for why the death penalty would be justified. It's not going to be justified on the basis of, well, that's what he just deserves. He just deserves to die. If he committed murder, he just deserves it. Uh, that's, that's not a utilitarian way of thinking. A utilitarian way of thinking is, let's just look at the net gain, net loss going forward. Um, we have to add up all the pain and suffering that we're going to bring about if we um, put the person to death. And we have to add up all the pleasure, mental pleasure, physical pleasure, all the happiness that is going to be saved or promoted if we do commit this um, act of putting this person to death. And then wherever, whatever the, the ledger, we sort of do the utilitarian calculus and ideally we would come up with a result that, well, it's more likely or it's very likely that this is going to be a positive thing for society then we would do, indeed, it would be morally right to, to, to do the death penalty. And if not, then not. Um, let's talk about another situation. Another case is, um, we'll call it euthanasia. I, I think I put that term down in your notes. Um, euthanasia is sometimes called mercy killing and maybe that's not the best translation. The word euthanasia actually means a good death. Uh, suppose somebody is sick, ill, but they're not gonna die naturally for a long time and they're in pain. Okay, suppose you have a person who is sick, in pain, but if they were just left to natural causes, it's going to take a long time for them to die, and they're going to suffer a lot, and then they're going to die. So, um, would, it be, would it be morally right to put this person to death? Um, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that they want to die. Okay, um, would, it be, would it be acceptable morally to kill someone uh, let's suppose they've consented, although it, it's not necessarily clear that that should matter, but let's suppose you have someone who, who wants to die, and they want to die quickly, and they want you to help them die. Um, so, would that be morally right? So, how would Mill's principle apply? Well, again, what you'd have to do is tally up as it were. You have to do a calculus. Um, how much pain, how much pleasure am I going to be causing or, or producing or preventing if indeed we help this person die? Um, and how much pain or pleasure, how much physical pain, mental pain, and so on, excuse me, uh, are we causing if we uh, do not help the person to die? And the, the morality would just be determined by that calculation. Now, I'm not saying, and Mill would certainly not, it's not easy necessarily to, to make this calculation. Um, uh, but in certain cases, it might be pretty clear that, listen, this person is going to suffer a lot for let's say another five years and then they're gonna die anyway. If you, if you help them die now, you're saving them basically five years of pain. And let's suppose you know that the pleasure they're going to have during that time is both physical and mental pleasure is going to be very, very minimal because they're in pain all the time. Okay, um, so according to uh, Mill's principle of utility, it looks like in some cases it is going to be the morally right thing to do 
to help a person end their suffering by uh, by having a by 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 helping them uh, kill themselves or by killing them if that's what they ask you to do. Um, now, of course, you might have to consider um, you know spin off effects, after effects that would go into the calculation. For Mill. Um, if we were to engage in this practice very freely and very easily, uh, mercy killing or euthanasia, maybe that would have the result in the long term of our bringing it about that um, people are people who, who might have gotten cured are going to end up getting killed early. So there might be some reasons for not doing this too often if you're a utilitarian, because th there might be negative spin-off effects to society at large over the long term. We always have to look at the net gain, but it seems like in certain specific cases, a utilitarian is going to uh, be able to argue, well, based on utilitarianism, it's gonna follow that um, mercy killing is the right thing to do. So, um, you know, this, this view would then conflict with some other moral views um, that, that we might find outside, outside utilitarianism. Some people, either based on religious convictions or um, based on views about the sanctity of life. I mean, usually that's kind of associated with a religious view, but one might think that somehow life is intrinsically valuable and that even if a person wants to die early we don't have the right to play god let's say and and kill someone even if that's what they want um or, or with the death penalty of course there are many um, religious people who are opposed to the death penalty based on the notion that somehow life is holy or, or um, that, that God is the only one who has the right to determine when a person dies and so on. And even if this person is a murderer, uh, there's something wrong about depriving someone of their life regardless of the consequences. So if you're thinking something like that, if you're thinking that no, even if this would bring about a better result for society over the long term, it's still wrong, then that would be a sign that you do not agree with utilitarianism. Okay, so there's again, there's the main point I was making there was uh, Mill's principle can be applied to real-time situations, real dilemmas to come up with real answers. Uh, we did talk about the fact that sometimes it's difficult to figure out the future and sometimes it's difficult to make the expected, uh, to make the uh, utilitarian calculus. Um, and in situations, there may be situations where two options are both going to result in the same amount of happiness or unhappiness and then you're in a genuine dilemma and that's, as we said, that's what Mill would just say, well, that's just the way life is, it's not a fault in his principle. Um, anyway, that was number two. We're going to move on now and talk about um, the third thing today is kind of um, some things we've said today already lead into this, but we're going to talk about some criticisms of Mill's principle that rely upon the claim that if we take his principle seriously, and apply it to certain situations, we're going to see that it yields an absurd result. Absurd meaning absurd in the sense that it doesn't seem to feel right. That is what is moral. Mill's principle is going to tell us that certain actions are either morally right or morally obligatory when in fact it would seem that um, in those situations um, his principle is, is, is giving us the wrong answer. And I'm going to give you several examples that many critics of utilitarianism like to, uh, like to talk about. And um, that is, first of all, and I think I listed these uh, in the notes that I gave you. I hope you can hear me. It's very quiet here at Bellarmine. There's really nobody else around. But anyway, let's continue. 
Um, let's talk about um, a couple cases of lying, telling falsehoods. Um, sometimes um, you're faced with a situation where uh, if you tell the truth, someone is going to get, uh, have their feelings hurt. Or um, in some cases you might be lying to avoid embarrassment or actually you could be lying to avoid some kind of punishment or lying to, um, to save face, so to speak, to avoid your own embarrassment. So, I mean, these are somewhat, you know, different cases, but I'm kind of lumping these all together. Um, let's give the following example. Suppose somebody is... Um, getting dressed up to go on a date and you're the roommate you're the housemate and your your pal asks you they're just about to leave go out the door and they um they ask you okay well how do i look do i look all right do i look good how's my you know my clothes do i have my hair am i do i look good they want that final sort of you know thumbs up and encouragement is really what they're looking for and let's suppose um, you look at them and, you know, they really don't look that good. Um, maybe it's the clothes, maybe it's the hair, maybe it's just the way their, um, their makeup, I don't know, whatever it is, the golden chain is whatever missing. Whatever the uh, situation is, they don't really look that good, but they don't really have time to change. Let's just suppose, hypothetically, that, you know, there's, they don't really have time to change. So you're faced with, if you tell them the truth of what you really think, they're going to feel bad, they're going to lose confidence. Um, whereas if you just say, hey, you look great. Yeah, it's just, you look fantastic. You look, go get them. So, you know, it's probably not going to really make a difference anyway on the date. Um, it, it might, but the point is you know right now that they, they, they don't have time to change. They're not going to change. They're not going to look any better. And... So you're faced with a situation where um, if, you, if, you, if you lie, you say, oh, you look great, wonderful, you're going to make them feel better and more confident, whereas if you tell the truth, they're going to feel, let's suppose you know, they're just going to feel uh, inconfident and it might actually make the date worse. Okay, so this isn't maybe the biggest moral dilemma in the world, but what we're talking about is, is it okay to lie sometimes because... Uh, you're going to save them from feeling hurt and you're going to boost their confidence. So Mill's principle would seem to indicate that yes, you should lie, at least in some cases. I'm not saying he would say you should lie in every case, but it looks like Mill's principle is going to endorse morally lying in order to avoid hurting someone's feelings because after all, so you're going to lie, big deal. It's, it's not gonna, it's, in this case, lying actually helps a person in terms of its consequences. So it seems like lying is the right thing to do. I mean, another case sort of related is, um, let's suppose that you're a kid and you've eaten the last cookie from the cookie jar and your mom told you to not have any cookies until uh, tomorrow and you went ahead and, and, and ate the cookie from the cookie jar and mom comes in, finds the cookie jar empty and says, hey, did you have that cookie? Did you have the last cookie from the cookie jar? And now you know that if you tell the truth, you're gonna get punished in some way. And if you lie and say, no, Ma, don't you remember? We, we finished those cookies uh, yesterday. And maybe, maybe Ma will believe it. Let's suppose maybe she's not so clear on how many cookies were in the cookie jar and so on. So you might say, um, hey, if I lie, I'll avoid punishment. If I tell the truth, I'm going to get punished. So why not just lie? Because, yeah, it's, it's you know, maybe there's, there's many cases where lying is a bad thing. It brings about negative consequences. But in this particular case... It's kind of like the situation of lying in order to save someone's life. I mean, it's not the same thing, of course. You're not lying to save your life here. You're lying to avoid being, let's say, put in time out. And, um, but time out is gonna be painful for you, and that's something to consider. And so therefore, it looks like, according to Mill, we have here a case where lying to avoid embarrassment or to avoid some, some penalty or punishment is actually going to turn out to be the morally right thing to do. 
Does that sound right? Does it sound right to say, this is where we have to bring up the issue of um, moral intuitions. Okay, a moral intuition is just a fancy way of saying um, that we have, we all have certain kind of gut reactions to moral questions. Like if I ask you, um, is it morally right to torture a child for fun? Everyone's gonna say, oh no, that's terrible, that's awful, right away. In other words, off the top of your head, uh, you have a moral intuition, you just know, or you feel you know. Maybe you're wrong, perhaps, but there's certain moral intuitions that we have very strongly, that certain things are immoral. So um, I think a lot of people have a moral intuition. Now, wherever these moral intuitions come from is a good question, but uh, a lot of people might think that, look, lying is wrong. If, if you're lying to your mother or you're lying to your friend, about the way they look, even if it's going to um, prevent embarrassment, it's still wrong. Lying is wrong. Is some philosophers think that certain actions or types of actions are intrinsically wrong to do or certain actions are intrinsically right to do and it's not because of their consequences. Now why those things would be right or wrong is a good question, but um, if you're feeling or thinking that lying is wrong even when it's to save face, even if it's to save some kind of embarrassment or punishment like going to your room for an hour. If you think that that's wrong to do, then you're probably disagreeing with utilitarianism. Uh, so those are a couple of cases to think about. Now there's a couple of more serious um, cases um, where it seems that Mill's principle, at least many philosophers claim, Mill's principle has given us or will, would give us a, uh, a faulty or absurd bad result. And one of these cases is called the scapegoat case. Okay, the scapegoat case is, let's suppose that, um, I mean, basically the idea of a scapegoat is someone who's innocent who gets blamed for a crime that he or she or they did not commit. And um, they get punished, um, but because they get punished, a lot of other people who are, let's say, innocent and might have been caught up in some kind of tragedy or violence are saved. Okay, so, um, let me just concoct a little scapegoat example, uh, hypothetical situation for you. And I think these, these situations are not so unrealistic. They've, they happen in real life sometimes. Um, you know, let's suppose that uh, a, um, uh, suppose that there's been, a, there, there has been some kind of a, a murder of a political figure and um, there's been some kind of assassination and um, there's a, a situation where um, a lot of people are angry because they believe they uh, that the person who assassinated this particular uh, leader are, are members of a certain group that were opposed to this political leader and so there's going to be there's going to be a riot. There's going to be there's going to be a mob violence. There's going to be a lot of people killed unless the police can somehow find out who committed the murder, and um, uh, and they can show that this person did it and sentence this person to death. Then the mob will sort of be satisfied, and uh, there won't be this riot, which is going to let's say bring about a lot of death and destruction for many innocent people. So let's suppose you're the policeman, or you're the chief of police, and you've tried to find out who committed the murder. You know that if you can find the murderer, you'll prevent a riot and prevent a lot of death. But um, let's suppose you've tried very hard and you can't, you can't, you just can't figure out who the assassin is. But let's suppose you have the, you have the ability, because you are the chief of police, let's just suppose hypothetically that you have the ability to frame someone. You have the ability to make it look like some person, who's totally innocent by the way, you have the ability to make it look like that person really did commit the crime. And you can, you can uh, fabricate all the evidence and put that person on trial 
and that way the, the mob, the riot, will be avoided. Okay, maybe this is a little bit far-fetched, but I don't think it's too far-fetched. Again, the situation is, if you, as chief of police, frame someone who's innocent and have that person put to death, um, even though he's innocent, and you know he's innocent, uh, but you have the ability to frame that person, put them to death, and you know that that will thereby avoid a massive riot where there's gonna be many, many innocent people killed. Um, so, in that case, what's the right thing to do? Well, it seems like um, our moral intuitions, or at least my moral intuitions tell me, it's still wrong to do. The guy is innocent. It's the wrong thing to do. If there's going to be a riot, unfortunately, that's too bad. Um, according to Mill's principle, it looks like it would be morally right to kill the innocent person, frame and kill him, even though it's not a pleasant thing to do, but on balance, remember, consequentialism. Mill's theory is that you look at the net gain or loss of happiness in society at large by doing a certain action. Now, there is a risk that, you know, uh, the whole thing could be found out, but there's always risk in anything we do uh, that it could backfire. And so, um, having taken into account the risks of, let's say, Maybe it will be found out, but if you're pretty confident that you as chief of police have the ability to frame this person and the, 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 the mob, the riot will be avoided, then you're basically looking at killing one innocent person in order to save, let's say, the lives of many, many innocent people. So on balance, it would seem that the utilitarian calculus leads to the conclusion that you should kill the scapegoat. And that does not seem to fit with at least a lot of our moral intuitions about what is right in that particular case. So it seems to show, perhaps, that Mill's principle must be wrong. Um, a similar case is, let's talk about slavery, okay? Um, if we have a situation where, let's suppose there's, um, I'll just make this sort of hypothetical, um, suppose we, we, we have a society of, let's say, a hundred people, and um, five out of the hundred people can be made into slaves for the other 95. And if we do this, the other 95 people, let's just suppose, this may sound like a horrible thing, but let's suppose that if we make five people out of a hundred people, slaves for the 95 people. Now, what exactly I mean by a slave is, you know, they're going to do their dirty work. Um, they're going to be maybe owned by their owners or owned by the other 95 people, and they're going to share them. And those five people are going to work really hard for the other 100 people. Um, but because, they, because these 95 people have these five slaves, the 95 people are going to be um, happier. Maybe that sounds a bit perverse, but let's suppose that that was true, they, that they looked at these five people and didn't really like them anyway for whatever reason. Um, and so uh, it looks like from a utilitarian point of view, as long as the total net gain in society's happiness is going to be greater by making them slaves, so then it will turn out that that's the morally right thing to do. Okay, you would have to take into account their suffering. Okay, so if the five slaves are going to be really treated very, very poorly, um, if there's going to be, if, if they're going to be horribly treated, then that might get, might, would make it worse to do, but let's suppose you're, they're gonna be treated uh, like slaves, but there's gonna be certain rules about how bad they can't be treated. So they're gonna be kind of, uh, they're gonna be taken care of, they'll have their needs met by their owners, but they're gonna be slaves and they're gonna have to work hard. It could turn out that on balance, the a total net gain in society's happiness is actually larger when these people are made into slaves. Um, now, of course, if you made 50 people slaves to 50 people, then you're probably looking at a utilitarian calculus where that would clearly be the wrong thing. 
but this this seems to be uh, the result, um, at least in the hypothetical situation that I'm describing, that Mill's principle of utility would imply that enslaving five people to make 95 people happier might turn out to be the right thing because actually what this what this what this situation uh, what this hypothetical situation points to is that Mill's principle refers to the net gain of total amount of happiness in society at large and it doesn't say anything about the distribution of happiness. This is what some philosophers say, that the principle of utility is faulty because it focuses on the total net gain of happiness in society, and there has to be some way of taking into account the distribution of happiness, not just the total amount of happiness. Um, so some philosophers think maybe there's some way of fixing the principle of utility to take account of distribution and some philosophers think that well once you do that you're giving up the principle of utility so you might as well say that utilitarianism is is wrong okay I've given you a couple cases uh, already scapegoat we talked about uh, slavery um, now let's talk about something which is a hypothetical situation which is sometimes called the train track dilemma there are other names for this dilemma. I didn't make this up, and I didn't make any of these cases up. But the train track dilemma is as follows. Let's suppose uh, you are the conductor of a train, and the train is going down uh, some tracks, and um, it's supposed to be coming to a stop, but unfortunately something's wrong with the train, and the train is not stopping no matter what you do you can't get the train to stop so you're on this train it's going and it's going and it's going and you're, you're tearing your hair out trying to figure out how to stop the train stop the train and it's going at full speed and um, you know you're coming up to um, a certain fork in the road or fork in the train tracks and you know that the train is going to go to the right as opposed to the left because that's just the way um, that's the way the the train is set up that it, it always goes to the right unless you flip a switch in which case the train will turn toward the left but you know that the train is going to go toward the right uh, if you don't do anything so you're coming up to this fork in the road or fork in the train tracks and on on the right side of uh, the tracks you look a little further down you see that, that there's five people sitting on the tracks. Now, why they're sitting on the tracks, I don't know, but let's just suppose there's five people sitting on the tracks because they don't expect the train to be over there at all. And on the left side, you see that there is uh, one person sitting on the track. Okay, you got it? You're the conductor. The train is running and running and running. You can't figure out how to stop it. Um, and you're coming to a fork in the in the road or a fork in the train tracks. Uh, if you don't do anything, the train is going to turn to the right and kill five people. If you flip the switch, then it's going to only kill one person. Because if you flip the switch, the train will go to the left, and there's only one person sitting on the left-hand train track. So now you have a little dilemma. What should you do? If you do nothing, five people are gonna die. If you do something, the other guy, who wouldn't have been injured had you done nothing, is going to be killed on that left train track. So, what's the morally right thing to do? Um, Mill's principle would give a very clear-cut answer, it seems here. His, uh, his advice would be definitely to pull the lever and switch the train to avoid five people getting killed rather than one. Because uh, obviously, uh, a net, if you don't do anything, five people are gonna die. If you switch the lever, one person's gonna die. Now, um, does that fit with your moral intuitions? Do you think that that would be the right thing to do? Some people would argue that, well, if you don't do anything, if you just don't flip any levers, you're not responsible for killing anybody. It wasn't your fault. 
that the train is going on and on without stopping. And um, therefore, the best thing to do is do nothing. Whereas if you um, do something, if you flip that lever, yeah, you're going to prevent the five people from getting killed, but now you're going to be causing, in effect, the death of that uh, person who's on the left track. So I don't know what I think about this situation. Um, I guess, you know, you should think about what you think about it. Um, it to me, it seems like in this case, maybe Mill, maybe Mill's principle does give the right answer. I mean, if five people are going to die, that's worse than one in general, right? So, um, yeah, I feel pretty bad for that one guy who would have been okay had I not flipped the lever, but I'm saving five. Well, you know, now that I think about it, I really don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe this is one of those dilemmas that really our moral intuition say there's no right answer, but Mill's principle says there is a right answer. Save five people and avoid killing one. And is that, is that morally right? Uh, is that, is, does that co cohere with our moral intuitions is the question. Okay, that's another case. Uh, we talked about the train track case, and now I'm going to talk about uh, something called the mismatched socks example. Okay, so the mismatched socks example is a lot lighter than the uh, other cases we've been talking about. Uh, the case of the mismatched socks, I'm talking about socks that you wear on your feet, okay? Um, let's suppose you have a fellow, and this, this example might be a bit dated. You probably would want to come up with a different example to make the same point. But um, mismatched socks, what's going on here is, let's suppose you have a guy who uh, comes to work or school every day wearing mismatched socks. And he also wears kind of, you know, we used to call them high waters, uh, pants that are, you know, don't go down to the shoe so you can see the mismatched socks that this guy wears. He's, it's, he's kind of a goofy guy. He wears mismatched socks, and it's sort of, it's not the most painful thing in the world to look at, but let's suppose, just hypothetically, let's suppose that there's, you know, a lot of people don't care about it, they don't even notice, even if they did notice, they wouldn't mind it, but let's suppose that every day this guy comes to school, there's, let's say, um, 20 people that that it, it's irksome to them. It bothers them that this guy is wearing mismatched socks. Um, and the only reason he's wearing mismatched socks, by the way, is he's not trying to make a fashion statement. He's just too lazy to sort out his socks in the morning. Or he's just too lazy to pair his socks when he uh, does the laundry. So what happens is he... Um, throws all of his socks into a big drawer, and when he wakes up in the morning, he uh, puts on mismatched socks, and he goes to school, and he just doesn't give a damn about um, how he looks to other people. Uh, and let's suppose it is irksome to, let's say, 20 out of, maybe there's a thousand people on campus, I don't know, whatever it is, 1,200, 1,300, it's irksome to a certain number of people. They find it annoying. So, annoying behavior, according to Mill, is going to be immoral because anytime you're causing unhappiness, you are doing something immoral if you have the option of avoiding that causation of unhappiness, right? I mean, if, if, if all you have are mismatched socks, which doesn't really make sense, well, I guess if, if all you had was mismatched socks and you were too poor, to afford buying matching socks, then, you know, that would be a different situation. But in the hypothetical I'm giving you, what we have here is a person who's just, they're just lazy, not, uh, not willing to match their socks to look decent. Um, and they come to school wearing mismatched socks and it annoys a certain number of people. Well, according to Mill, excuse me, according to Mill, uh, that is going to be an immoral action. And somehow, I think many of us would say, even if it does cause annoyance, 
that's not immoral or somehow that invades autonomy. Now, the word autonomy is not a word we've used much or maybe at all in this class. Um, I'm just using the word autonomy. Autonomy means uh, self-governance, the notion that we think people should have a certain amount of freedom to, um, to be who they want to be, even if it is annoying to other people, let's say. So according to Mill's principle, it looks like if the autonomy, I mean, autonomy is a, is, is a thing that makes people happy too. We want to be in a society where we promote um, autonomy because that, that gives us a certain kind of happiness and pleasure in running our own lives. But in this situation, um, if the guy just spent a minute or two smashing his socks or in the morning getting his socks matched, he would avoid causing 20 people um, some some irksomeness, some annoyance. So therefore, it seems that uh, he has the obligation to match his socks. And I think for many of us, that would seem to be absurd to say that that's immoral. So here, I would have given you in summary, these are the cases, these are the hypo, there are many, many other hypothetical situations that we can imagine where we might test, as it were, moral, uh, Mill's principle against our moral intuitions. Does his principle give us an absurd result? And what would Mill say in response to some of these cases? Well, um, I'm gonna leave that up to you to think about. I'll give you a few ideas uh, what Mill might say in response to some of these cases. He might say, number one is he could say, you know what, your moral intuitions are just wrong. You know, you might have been brought up thinking that it's always bad to lie no matter what. Maybe, maybe that's what you think, but in some cases lying is actually okay. Um, or you might have thought that human beings have some kind of intrinsic worth. Where'd you get that from? Just focus on the consequences. You know, I'm referring to the case of the death penalty or euthanasia. If it's going to prevent less, uh, I'm sorry, if it's going to prevent uh, unhappiness from occurring, then that's what you should do. Um, if it's killing someone early or mercy killing. So Mill might say that our moral intuitions are, are, are wrong and we should adjust our moral intuitions to fit the principle of utility. Another possibility is he might say that in some of these cases we've been unfair to Mill, that if we really think hard about the consequences of our actions, maybe in the short run, lying to save face um, or mercy killing is going to prevent some harm, but in the long run, if we do that a lot, it's going to bring about some kind of unhappiness in the long run. Um, especially like in the case of the scapegoat, there is that worry that it could be found out, and then there's going to be an even worse mob and riot. So um, these are some of the things that Mill might say. We have to take into account all the possible consequences, and when we do that, maybe in some of these hypotheticals, it turns out that um, uh, the right thing to do was what we thought it was, but it's, it's consistent with the principle of utility once we take into account the um, uh, long-term consequences of our behavior. Okay, um, concluding remarks on Mill are simply that um, the principle of utility is a very popular theory that many philosophers to this very day uh, accept, either in the form that Mill proposed it or with some modifications, um, but we've clearly seen that the principle of utility uh, is a consequentialistic theory and that there are some uh, some hypothetical and some real situations where maybe the principle of utility is shown to be wrong or mistaken. So I'm going to leave it at that for today.